Good evening, everyone, and welcome. Oh, little doubling in our home. Little doubling of the voice. Welcome to Dome at Home. My name is Scott Young, and I am the planetarium astronomer at the Manitoba Museum here in Winnipeg, Manitoba, Canada, Treaty 1 territory. And it is another great night for Dome at Home. Good to see people checking into the chat there. Nice to see some of the regulars already. Nice to, uh, nice to see you as always. I was hoping we'd have some clear skies tonight. Maybe there'd be some observing afterwards. Doesn't look like it, unfortunately. But uh, we've got a great show for you today, so we're going to get right into things. We have, uh, well, if you recall, last week we had a bit of a kerfuffle in the astronomy world with this random meteor shower that was supposed to uh, come out of nowhere, basically, and was threatening a thousand meteors per hour. Um, and that had us preempt our scheduled content. We're bringing that to you this week. Um, we are going to touch base on the meteor shower, show some of your images and things like that. But I'd like to go right to our featured speaker uh, for this evening. Dr. Ed Clutis is a scientist here in Winnipeg. And uh, we were just talking before the show how it's amazing. It's such a small astronomical community. And he and I have never met face to face. We, you know, we hear of each other and we move in the same circles, but uh, just have never gotten together. So it's really great to uh, have him on the show. He's been working here in Winnipeg, but really working on Mars. So I'm going to bring uh, him on here and hopefully this is going to work. Oh, you know what? We're just going to go right to that there and I'm going to see if I can bring his camera. Live interviews. Gotta love it. All right. Hi, Ed. Can you hear me out there? Scott, excuse me. Yes, I can hear you just fine. Great. All right. So it's really great to have you here. Sorry for bumping you last week, but uh, we thought this meteor shower would be a big deal. But this is a more long-lived kind of uh, program that you're working on. Tell us a little bit about what you're working on in terms of uh, your research. So, you know, um, I've, I've been involved in a number of things and I'll, I'll touch on the, the Mars stuff, but I wanted to give you, uh, people always ask, you know, how did you end up in Winnipeg doing, doing research on Mars? So here's the uh, very condensed version of the important parts of my life, I guess. I first got into planetary uh, exploration, planetary geology when I took an elective course in my third year of an engineering degree at University of Toronto. It was taught by a professor named Dave Strangway, who was uh, involved in in Apollo uh, missions since you know since the early days of the Apollo program, uh, and so that kind of got me hooked, and I decided this is something that I want to do, um, and so finishing up my uh, undergrad degree. I uh, worked for a bit and then I went off to uh, University of Hawaii to study planetary geology. Uh, and then came back to uh, to Canada, did my PhD at the University of Alberta. So um, my formative years were in, you know, the, the, my master's, I guess, was in the US, uh, but I always wanted to come back to Canada. And then uh, did a PhD in Edmonton, bounced around a little bit, and then eventually ended up at the University of Winnipeg. So been doing planetary geology for uh, more years than I care to think about. <laughs> That's great. Yeah, it's, it's interesting to know, you know, you had that experience where you took a single course and had a single professor that sort of inspired what would yeah. become your career right that's a very similar story to me we had yeah uh, it seems a lot of people are that way right you, you you know you try different things you finally find something that really grabs you and that that becomes your career i guess yeah yeah, yeah. exactly no great stuff mm -hmm. yeah well, so what so i see here viking orbiter views of mars on yeah that was here Right, that was that was uh, the first or second project I was involved in uh, when I got to University of Hawaii. So this is way back in um, 1982, and uh, we had images from orbit from the Viking orbiter, and uh, we were using those images to look at some of the the features on Mars that suggest that there was running water. And so it was kind of it was a mapping exercise with mostly from images, not very sophisticated analysis, kind of beyond that. Cool. That, that was one of the landmark missions, basically. The Vikings were, you know, really the, the main serious Mars missions. Yeah. And, uh, I mean, since then, we've gotten to the point of, you know, not just landers, but rovers, and, and more recently, even a helicopter. We have these uh, autonomous craft that take selfies of themselves and things like that. It's amazing how 
quickly that's developed really in terms of technology. Yeah, absolutely. If you look at you know the sort of the history of of, uh, of Mars exploration, the Viking missions were really designed to do one thing, which was look for signs of life on Mars, and uh, those results you know seem to come back negative. And then there was kind of a hiatus of Mars exploration. Um, so here's a here's a, a view of the uh, the Viking orbiter. Uh, you know, there's a lot of things labeled here, but really uh, the, the the business side is at the bottom there with a couple of cameras. The rest is just sort of the you know the, the pieces to keep the spacecraft going. Um, but yeah, they've they've gotten. I'll just skip over this. This is some of the stuff I did uh, exploring the moon back in the day. Um, but um, let me just jump ahead to Mars. So. Um, yeah, so as I was saying, you know, Mars exploration has kind of evolved from the Viking missions, which didn't find signs of life, and then NASA kind of backed off a little bit and said, you know, let's let's understand Mars better before we commit ourselves to looking for signs of life again. And so, you know, series of missions from the, about the mid '90s on, we had the little Pathfinder rover, which was like the size of a microwave almost. Uh, and then we moved up to the Mars Exploration Rovers, which were bigger, and then the Curiosity Rover of about a decade ago. And now we have Perseverance on Mars. Um, and, um, you know, Curiosity is still going strong after 10 years. Perseverance is there, and we shouldn't forget that the Chinese also have a solar-powered rover uh, that's been operating on Mars for many months now. I just can't remember exactly when they landed. So, you know, the U.S. is not the only one. Um, there are other nations and, and there will be future missions by the Europeans and others. So Mars is becoming a place to, to really, uh, that's generating a lot of interest. Yeah, definitely. I mean, the Viking results, I remember there was, I was you know, I, I, I grew up on Carl Sagan's Cosmos, so he gets mm -hmm. right into that, of course. And uh, the idea that there was just so many um, uncertainties that they didn't even know really what to do when they, when they sent the Viking orbiters. So now with a greater understanding, maybe there's a better chance for those kinds of experiments to happen. I think um, one of the things I wanted to ask you about, um, you've got Curiosity here. Curiosity has been going, like you say, for 10 years. It's got mm -hmm. the little um, nuclear reactor driving it rather than the solar panels. What right. kinds of things, like what would you say are its big uh, contributions to Mars research? I'd say the big one. So they landed in a place called uh, Gale Crater, which seemed to uh, be a place where you there may have been standing water uh, at some point in Mars's history, and um, the rover was able to confirm that it was uh, it was really designed to determine whether there was you know at least one place on Mars that was habitable. And with the instruments that they have, you know, various ways of analyzing for minerals and elements um, and, and uh, just environmental conditions, they pretty much determined that, yes, at some point in Mars history, it was it was habitable. So um, that sort of has fed into Perseverance, which is now designed um, also to assess habitability, but also now to start to search for uh, signs of life. and. Um, you know, it sounds very simple. Oh, we're going to go look for life on Mars, but it's actually a pretty hard thing to do, especially if you're looking at a place where the life is, you know, maybe long gone, or if it's there, it's very sparse, and it's going to be, you know, microbial in size, if that. Um, so it's a really, it's a really hard thing to do. So I think our our exploration for life on Mars is going to kind of, um, it's going to go in stages of increasing sophistication. So um, knowing that it was habitable, that means that, um, you know, Mars could have hosted life maybe similar in some ways to terrestrial life. Um, and so as our understanding of Mars improves, I think our, our search for life will become um, better targeted and we'll, we'll be able to fly more sophisticated instruments, but also instruments that will be able to search for, I guess, a range of possible kinds of life. But it, it's tough. It really is tough to figure out, you know, how best to search for these probably sparse signs of life if they're even there. Well, right. You've got these, you know, they're going to be microscopic. They yeah. might not be existing. They might be deep under the surface. We really don't even know, you know, where to look for them. Um, right. And, and we've heard about, you know, the idea that maybe they're in caves under the surface, things mm -hmm. like that. Well, that's a whole different mission than crawling around on the surface, right? 
Right. Yeah. You know, the one thing, so, so the Europeans had planned a mission to Mars as well, the Roslyn Franklin Rover that was supposed to go this year until uh, trouble started. Um, and so it's been delayed and we don't know until when, but one of its, um, one of its capabilities beyond what perseverance can do is to be able to drill a meter or two beneath the surface to search for signs of life. Because, you know, we know that the, the current uh, surface of Mars is really inhospitable to pretty much any kind of life that you could think about. Um, but there's a chance that in the subsurface, the conditions are a little more stable, uh, a little more Earth-like. So um, that's going to be its big contribution is getting beneath the surface and, and searching. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And that, well, we'll see when that goes, but uh, yeah. that's, a, that's another exciting mission. Mm -hmm. What do you think will be the watershed moment in terms of you know our understanding of Mars, will it be uh, coming from another rover? Will it be from another kind of technology? Um, like what's kind of next? Ugh. Well, you know, next that sort of it's hard to know what's going to happen in long term. But the next thing that's sort of on the drawing boards right now is Mars sample return. And so the Perseverance rover has a, a, a drill system underneath it that can take little little rock cores. And so, you, you know, the size of the cores that we're talking about would be about the size of your pinky. So, you know, pretty small rock cores, not very deep, but um, it's, it's, um, it's designed to collect samples that are pristine, that have not been contaminated by the rover itself. And so those are going to come back, uh, you know, plans are sort of 2028, 20, 2030 maybe. And I think that'll give us our best chance of of detecting life on Mars, um, because again, you know, with being able to bring the samples back to our labs here, we've got really sophisticated equipment to look for, you know, tr the smallest traces of organic molecules and, and microbes. Um, and that's a lot of that technology. We'll probably never be able to miniaturize it enough to put it on a rover or a lander on Mars. So I think sample return is kind of the thing that so many of us are hanging our hats on about you know definitive proof but of course you can always argue that maybe we landed in a place where there are no signs of life and it was never habitable and all this sort of thing so uh yeah it's going to take a while yeah yeah absolutely i mean any kind of planetary mission is just i mean you're you've, you've got such a small area that you can really cover even with a helicopter or something like that and if you think about doing that on the earth if you randomly picked one spot on the earth and tried to characterize the whole planet from that, obviously you, you miss so much. So I guess you kind of, um, it's almost a needle in a haystack. Yeah, it kind of is, you know, if we knew, you know, how long light Mars was habitable and, um, you know, whether, well, the big questions, of course, of whether life arose, you know, we think the earth, life on earth arose from uh, being seeded by organic molecules that came in through asteroid and comet impacts, Mars would have suffered the same, uh, the same impacts. And so, you know, at least the starting conditions between Mars and earth were the same. And every indication we have is that, is that conditions on Mars early Mars and early earth were a lot more similar than they are now. So, you know, we know that life arose three-ish billion years ago and conditions on Mars at that time were were quite similar to the early Earth so you know unless there's something special about the conditions on Earth that led to life to arise here we should expect to find uh, simple life on Mars as well before before the conditions just kind of went went downhill right oh, yeah. okay we've got a question in our chat here from Ben who's asking um, is there any evidence of purple rocks, i.e. cyanobacteria or that kind of thing? Hey Ben, good question. Uh, we have identified, uh, yeah, we've, we've actually found rocks that are purplish on Mars, but it looks like it's just a, 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 a weathering coating that's on the rock. So it's kind of like rust. Um, so we have not found anything that we think is like cyanobacteria. You know, we're looking for things like, yes, like cyanobacteria, like these uh, very primitive structures called stromatolites, which are these rocks that are kind of, they're, they're alternating layers of bacteria and sediments and they just kind of grow. And so you get almost like this, this cabbage type arrangement. Uh, so we're hoping that we might see evidence of those. That would be, you know, on earth, those are the earliest signs of sort of uh, visible life, let's say. And so we're really keeping our eyes out for something like that. Um, but yeah, so even though we've seen purple rocks, they are, they turn out to be just iron rich kind of weathered, cruddy, rusty surfaces. 
Okay, great. Um, yeah. So another question I had for you. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, we often think of you know this kind of research being done in the states or at, at NASA or things like that. You're here in Manitoba, and doing cutting edge you know Mars research. What are the advantages or the disadvantages um, mm -hmm. of being based here versus even a larger center in Canada or somewhere in the states? Mm, good question. Uh, the advantage, I guess, for me is that, um, you know, we're brought in. So, so, you know, I'm one of the few sort of international people that's involved in these missions. They're very U.S. NASA focused, um, but they brought they brought me in or I, I got invited in because of, you know, some of the work that I've done over the years where uh, my research kind of focuses on how can we use the various cameras and, and spectrometers that are on the rover to explore Mars and to look for signs of life on Mars. And so we also have some environment chambers at the university here at the University of Winnipeg where we can simulate or reproduce the surface conditions on Mars. And so that kind of gives us a test bed to test uh, potential instruments for future rovers. So I think, uh, you know, what has helped us get on the mission has been this unique uh, capability that we've developed here that really was not available in any other laboratories around the world. So, you know, being able to carve out kind of this specialty or this niche was really what helped us get on the missions. Yeah. That's very cool. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's another point of pride for Winnipeg to have such a unique facility here, so. Absolutely. What I really like is that, you know, it also gives me an opportunity for uh, my students to work on the mission. So they're, you know, taking regular rover shifts and, you know, they're 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 doing more fun stuff than I am. I can tell you that. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's it's you know, I really I really like the fact that they've got this unique opportunity to be involved in in rover operations and they have just really embraced it and, and just running with it. It's 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 fantastic. Oh, I bet. What an inspiring thing to be able to say. Yeah, I worked on a Mars rover this afternoon. You know? Yeah, that's it. I had actually one of my students on shift this afternoon. So nice. yeah. Oh, that's mm -hmm. so cool. Yeah. Well, this is great. Oh, another question has come into the chat. Um, mm -hmm. The Stephen asks, is Mars older than the Earth? Uh, good question, Stephen. Uh, no, we think that all the planets formed within like a few millions to tens of millions of years of each other. So I think the solar system came into being uh, during one very compressed period of time. Um, and, you know, we have we have we have Mars meteorites or we have Mars samples on the Earth in the form of Mars meteorites. And we've age dated those and nothing has come up that's older than the age of the Earth. Yeah. So okay. everything suggests, yeah, that the two planets are of similar age. OK. Uh, Nikisha just asked a great question here. What kind of schooling do I need to t what kind of schooling do I need to take to do the work you do? That is an excellent question. Uh, what I can tell you is that, um, you know, obviously these missions are very science focused, um, but there's so many, um, there's so many disciplines and so many different people that are involved in this mission. We've got, you know, a ton of engineers. We have a ton of geologists. You can get in via chemistry. You can get in via physics. You, you know, nowadays you can also get in via biology. So, you know, there's there's a number of science disciplines that can lead you to this kind of an opportunity for sure. I came in, you know, via engineering and then switched over to geology. Uh, one of the uh, students that I have uh, on the team right now from here is uh, uh, she graduated with a, a bachelor's in environmental studies. Um, I've got another student who's come in through chemistry. I've had students that have come in through biology. So, you know, it's a very interdisciplinary thing, this exploration of Mars. So there's a lot of, there is no one path that will get you onto the mission. There's a lot of different ways in. That's excellent. Yep. Science and math and, uh, you know, any flavor of science, I guess, even biology now, that's, that's great. You know, when I was yep. a kid, it was like, do your physics. And that yeah. was pretty much it, right? But that's right. Yeah. 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 Oh, uh, some it, more questions are coming in here. Um, sure. U Ulrika asks, uh, did Mars have tidal pools like here on Earth? Oh, uh, that's a good question. I don't know that we've sorted it out. Uh, it did, definitely had bodies of standing water on the surface. But Mars does. Mars has a couple of very tiny moons, which really don't exert any any um, gravitational influence. So I don't think it would have had like the same kind of tidal pool well it would no it would have had bodies of water but maybe not tides uh, sort of making them fluctuate right right yeah that makes sense uh, okay 
And uh, oh, Ben has asked a question. I'm not sure what this is uh, regarding. Is there evidence of nuclear explosions on Mars or anything like that? I mean, I think we see impact craters, but uh, is there any other things that have been found like that? No, you know, there's the, the surface is peppered with impact craters from asteroids and comets. There's a lot of volcanoes scattered across the surface too. So, you know, in that way, that's another way that Mars is similar to the Earth, that we have volcanoes that can, you know, bring material up from the subsurface and, and uh, you know, bring water, for instance, from the, from the mantle of Mars to the surface. But um, as far as nuclear explosions, no. All right. Well, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Plutus. It was great to have you here. I'd love to follow up again. We'll have to, we'll have to chat again because uh, this is fascinating stuff. Sounds good. Okay. okay. Thank you very much. Thanks okay. for joining thanks. us. Yep. Thanks, everyone. All right. That was Dr. Ed Plutus, and that was really cool because, um, like I say, I haven't had a chance to talk to him before, but I've heard lots about him, and uh, he's a great guy. All right, so, um, oh, I'm, I'm glad everybody liked it. That's great. Some nice comments coming in. All right, let us move along. I'm actually just going to make an audio adjustment here because throughout the entire interview, I've been listening to myself echo in only in my head. It doesn't echo out there, but to avoid the echo out there, I had to have my head echoing. So there we go. Okay. Um, last week we had some technical issues with um, I had so many big images in the uh, in the program that it basically broke down my image display um, program and so we didn't get a chance to actually see all of the images so I want to show you some of the images that we didn't get to last time uh, so this is an image uh, that uh, James sent in very uh, very nice shot of the Orion Nebula there he's uh, he's got a telescope and a little a little uh, camera that goes on it and um, this is a uh, he's got an alt azimuth telescope so it's not fully perfectly aligned with the north pole so he can only take short exposures but he's stacking them up obviously you've got it figured out james because this is pretty impressive material and i've got a few more images from james that i'll be peppering in through uh, other shows in june that was a picture for dr clutus Today, we're going to go through the June sky preview. And so to do that, I'm going to get our Stellarium system all set up. Now, we are in that point where it just does not get dark very early. And I really wish that we could have more darkness at this particular time of the year. But unfortunately, that's not the way it works. So let us take a look at our Stellarium view. There we go. 10.30 at night and the sun still hasn't fully set. You still have a bit of twilight lightening up the sky. Uh, and actually we can switch over to tonight. We've got a beautiful crescent moon that is starting to appear. It looks like it's going to be clear tomorrow, Friday, at least down here in southern Manitoba. And uh, so you can watch for the crescent moon in the evening. Pretty much the rest of the sky doesn't become fully visible till almost 11 o'clock, it seems. Nice and dark. Um, there we go. You know, by 11 o'clock, I've been able to start taking pictures from my backyard. I can see some stars before then, and I can start, you know, focusing, or I can start to find the constellations or things like that. But it really is... Uh, becoming a late night kind of thing. Our Big Dipper is still, well, it's such a big constellation. It takes quite a few, quite a few months to sort of move around uh, the sky. Part of it is overhead for a big chunk of the night, but it's finally starting to come down in the west, the Big Dipper here with the, the rest of the constellation that is Ursa Major. The arc of the handle here Arcs to Arcturus in the constellation of Boates the Herdsman. And this is where, right in about here, was where those meteors were supposed to come from. And we talked about this last week. So the meteor storm did happen. It just didn't happen with the maximum rate. Of course, it, you know, when they talk about the, the rates of meteors that were supposed to happen, it was up to a thousand per hour. Well, 
it didn't hit that. It was about 60 an hour, which is still one of the better meteor showers of the year. So, I mean, that's still pretty good. And actually, I, I, it was cloudy here, but I did talk to some friends out in, uh, in Ontario, and they, they were out, and all of the meteors were really bright and really slow and kind of yellowy-orange color. So a little bit different from a regular um, meteor event. So that was kind of cool. Um, but unfortunately, we won't have another chance to see that for who knows how long. However, if you did observe this, you should um, drop me a line and we'll make sure your report gets put in because the meteor counts are being used to refine these predictions. And so it would be really, uh, really useful this year or next year about this time we'll have a little bit more data to say if there's going to be another event or not. So hopefully we'll get another chance one day. But. All right, um, Boates is sort of the major constellation over in the south, this beautiful little circlet of stars, Corona Borealis, next to it. As we move over into the south and east, we have the summer stars coming up. We've got the summer triangle rising over in the east, by about midnight, it's high enough to clear all the trees and uh, it's starting to um, be quite visible. Each of those stars in the summer triangle is from a different constellation. This one is uh, Vega and Vega is about, uh, well, it's the brightest one of the three. It's about 25 light years away. So that means the light that we see tonight has actually been traveling. It left the star 25 years ago and it's been traveling through space ever since. So if you're 25, basically the light that you see from Vega is been traveling your entire life. Now, unfortunately, we don't have distances down to the precision to be able to say which star is exactly, you know, your age. But kind of neat to think of that idea that you're, you're seeing starlight that has been traveling through space as long as you have. Um, down at the bottom of this summer triangle, Altair here, sort of the middle brightness star, is only 16 light years away. Um, Fallon, you've got a 16th birthday coming up, if I recall. So uh, Altair would be a good birthday star for you. And then over here, Deneb, the faintest of the three. Um, and that kind of makes sense because uh, Deneb is 2200 light years away. So the calendar was BC and not AD when the light from Deneb left uh, that star. It's kind of amazing that we can see something that is that far away and it is still one of the brighter stars in the sky. I mean, sure, it's not as bright as Vega, but Vega is only bright because it's relatively close to us. The same with Altair. It's relatively close to us. Deneb is bright because it is massive, super blue giant star. And we, we get that sort of depth all throughout the um, you get that depth all throughout the sky. Each star is at a different distance. Some of them are bright because they're really close to us. Like Sirius, the brightest star in the sky in the winter, it's only close because it's almost next door. If it was at a more average distance, you would hardly notice it. But because it's so close to us, it appears like the brightest star in our sky. So it's brightness doesn't always tell you, you know, whether something is actually bright or whether it's just close by. Anyway, the, uh, the Summer Triangle is basically where the Milky Way goes through it. It goes through the Summer Triangle here and down towards the southeastern horizon. As the night goes on in June, those things will rise higher, of course, and we'll just move a little higher here, and then you can start to see the Milky Way. The Milky Way is hard to see unless you're outside the city, and you have to be able to be, um, you have to wait a little bit longer. If you're, if you're seeing it very close to the horizon, the, the haze and the atmosphere of our Earth just sort of blocks out that faint light. You need a really good view. It needs to be fairly high up in the sky to be able to, uh, to, be able to see it effectively. Let's uh, take a look at the morning sky because the morning sky is where all of the planets are. And not just most of the planets, literally all of the planets. If we uh, look at the sky at four in the morning, here's Saturn. Saturn is the first one to rise. It actually, 
it becomes an evening planet in June. At the end of June, it's, it rises at 11.58 p.m. So technically, it's up in the evening. I'm really stretching here because I hate getting up early in the morning. It'll get better into the fall, but for now, you still really have to get up quite early to be able to see things. Saturn is starting to get high enough, though, that if you've got a telescope, um, if you go at around four, it's high enough and out of the murk that you can start to get some good views. Farther along towards the east, we have brilliant Jupiter and much fainter Mars. Those two passed each other just a, excuse me, just a few days ago. And as June goes on, basically, Mars will uh, move, uh, Mars mostly stays where it is, and Jupiter will move this way um, with the rest of the sky. And so the two of them will separate over the course of the month. But um, Jupiter also getting up high enough by uh, the end of the month that we'll start to get some good telescope views of that. And Mars, we really have to wait quite a while because not only is Mars down low, it's also on the far side of the sun, so it's really small. So in a telescope, it just looks like a tiny little round, mostly round speck. Um, even probably the only thing you would be able to see is the fact that it's not perfectly round, it's slightly gibbous shaped, like, like a, a three quarters moon kind of thing. As the morning goes on, Venus rises over there in the east, but as Venus rises, the sun also is getting closer to the, closer to the uh, horizon and the sky is getting brighter. It's a very fine line between Venus being high enough to see and the sky being too bright to see Mars and even Saturn. I think around 4.30 right now we'll probably do it. Um, but by 5, I'm sure you will have lost Ven or, uh, Mars and Saturn. Now, right now, Mercury is too close to the sun. But right here, we have four of the five bright planets visible. If we skip forward towards the end of the month, I'm just going to sort of skip forward through time here. We're keeping it at 4.30. I'll turn off the satellites so they don't get in the way here. You can sort of see what's going on. Venus is kind of just moving to the left as it's uh, orbiting the sun, which is down below the horizon over here. Mars is sort of hanging in that spot. Jupiter and Saturn are both moving off to the right, but they're all still in this, basically in this line. You'll see people trumpeting the planetary alignments. Um, here's, a, here's a spoiler. The planets are always aligned. If you, if you just want, want them to be in a line like this, they're always in a line because the solar system is basically a plane. Uh, now, granted, right now, they're all aligned and in the same quarter of the sky, which is a little bit uncommon, but it's really not that big of a deal. So anybody that's telling you, oh, there's a unique planetary alignment, never going to happen again in our lifetime, all that kind of stuff, that's baloney. It happens all the time. This is one time that you can see it. So, I mean... You should be excited and go out and see it, but you shouldn't be, uh, it's, it's not a once in a lifetime thing. And it doesn't only happen on one night. I mean, basically the whole month, we can see those four planets really easily. Around the 18th of June, the moon enters the scene, coming in as sort of a, a third quarter moon, first passing Saturn, and then the next night in between Saturn and Jupiter. And then on the 20th, finally the 21st, nice and close to Jupiter, that'll be a nice, Nice pairing. Uh, I think both of those will appear in the same field of view of binoculars. Let's just check. Just going to move over here. Yeah, look at that. So in a pair of 7x50 binoculars, you could basically see the half moon and Jupiter. And this view doesn't quite show it, but some of the Jupiter satellites would be visible in there as well. So that'll be a nice night to get out, or morning. That's on the 21st. That's also the morning of the winter solstice. Or, the summer solstice, wow, you know the weather's been bad when, um, yeah. So the summer solstice occurs on the 21st, early in the morning, around, uh, around 4 in the morning, I think it is our time. And then the following day, the moon will be over closer to Mars. And then it sort of moves along over towards Venus. Now, by the time it gets down over to Venus, 
we're starting to see another little object come up here. That's Mercury. So towards the end of the month, theoretically, Mercury pops up above the horizon. Now I gotta say, Mercury is gonna be really low from our latitude here in, in Canada. It's just very, very low. I doubt anyone here will see it. Folks down south, you'll have a much better view. The, the angle of the ecliptic is, is um, different when you go farther, farther south. And so all of this, this view will just be sort of tilted up a little bit more. So you'll have a bit of an easier time to see Mercury. It's still gonna be tough because it's still gonna be quite low. But towards the end there on the, on the morning of June 27th, the very thin crescent moon would sort of point the way. Again, if we, uh, if we sort of zoom in with our binocular view, you can see that you could just barely see a tiny thin crescent moon and then the planet Mercury just above the trees. Uh, like I say, from here, I doubt it will be um, visible. But it is kind of cool because not only are the five bright planets all visible, but they happen to also be visible in order. You've got Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn. So literally in the order out from the sun, they happen to be from left to right. Total coincidence, totally meaningless, but kind of neat. So that's what we can watch for in the morning sky. Because they're all clustered in the morning sky, we have no planets in the evening, nothing to see basically, except when the moon is in the evening sky. So right now, basically, we have a beautiful evening uh, crescent moon. Someone was just saying, uh, oh, James was saying he saw the thin crescent moon just after dinner last night. Um, someone else had said about the moon. Oh yeah, Ben said the crescent moon was nice last night, but very thin. Yeah, if you caught it last night, it was just a little hairline, like a little fingernail clipping. Uh, really, really beautiful. Uh, let's see here. Do we have, uh, oh, lots of comments on my winter solstice comment there. Yeah, of course. Um, oh, Tiffany, Tiffany was asking, um, will we be seeing Vega as it was 26 years ago? Is there a situation where we'd, we would see something as it will be in the future? Oh, that's an interesting thought. So unfortunately, the speed of light basically um, means that we can only see things later than they actually are because to, to go the other way we'd be we'd have to see something before the light actually got emitted so unfortunately this only lets us look back in time and never forward which is kind of too bad but um it does work over amazing distances when we look at galaxies we're looking back millions of years and in fact the james webb space telescope will be looking back billions of years to the very earliest days of the universe um, and so that lets us sort of look back into the history and see how the universe has changed over time because the universe is really old and we're pretty new. And so we don't have, you know, personal human observations of what things were like in those early days. But if we look far enough away, we can see that. So unfortunately, only one direction. Uh, okay, I wanted to say, oh yes, um, tomorrow night, June the 3rd, is First Fridays. And uh, just like last month, the Manitoba Museum is doing First Friday programming. And so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to set the sky for tomorrow night. And unfortunately, because the sun doesn't go down until earlier, when we start at 5 o'clock, the main thing that we'll be looking at is the sun. So the local astronomy club, the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada will be out at the planetarium. We'll have telescopes set up around the dome and we'll be looking at the sun with safe solar filters, of course. And uh, in fact, there might even be one of the, tel the, uh, the hydrogen alpha telescopes, the ones that can show the prominences on the sun. We're, uh, we're hoping to be able to bring that. The planetarium will also be open we'll be doing, uh, there's actually a couple of cool things going on. There's uh, some live sky shows that I'll be doing. And uh, my colleague, Adriana, is, uh, is doing kind of a really neat musical thing uh, in celebration of Pride Month with a bunch of uh, basically music videos of different decades of music. So that's gonna be kind of fun. Um, and that's all free. And then the museum and the science gallery are also 
uh, open and available uh, for free. The dinosaurs exhibit is not a free one. We're not allowed to actually do that one for free because we literally pay for every person that goes in there. So, um, but you're welcome to come and check us out, come and do some telescope stuff. The other thing is the moon will be up there and we'll be able to see this beautiful thin crescent moon even in the daytime. And that'll be visible from five till nine when we sort of shut down. So if you wanna come and look through telescopes, come and join us at the Planetarium tomorrow night, the third. And uh, we'll be doing this again the first, um, the first Fridays in uh, not July because that's Canada Day, but in August and in September as well. So we're gonna be sort of doing this regular telescope stuff. I'm also gearing up for some other summer uh, activities. We had some great, uh, great times around the lunar eclipse and I wanna do another event like that sometime in the next month or so. So, oh, uh, Tara was saying, I saw the sun through the telescope when they were at Chapters. Yeah, that's right, they did uh, for Astronomy Day. Um, they were out at uh, Chapters Polo Park and just set up and doing the sun. Uh, yeah, the sunspots are really, really cool. And um, w if we can get one of the, uh, the hydrogen alpha telescopes out, you can actually see the, the flames that sort of come off the edge of the sun, the prominences. You need a special telescope for that kind of thing, but it really is a, a cool kind of thing. Of course, it depends what's going on in the sun that day. Some days there's piles of sunspots, other days not nearly as much. But All right, uh, the next thing that I wanted to get to is we still have a little bit of cool space stuff. So this is one of the pictures that I tried to bring you last week and wasn't able to. This is the comet uh, that caused the meteor shower. This is a view of it in um, 2006. And basically pieces of it were just fragmenting off. It went around the sun and, and the heat just was enough to disintegrate big chunks of the comet. And that debris cloud is what was spreading out. And they're trying to basically calculate where each of those pieces went because they sort of break up into clouds. and that's what we were predicting that we would sort of go through, excuse me, go through one of those pieces. But um, as you can understand, as soon as they fade away, we can't see them anymore. So really it is all just calculation and, and uh, trying to figure out the velocities and all that kind of stuff. So it's not like we can know for sure that it's gonna happen, hence the predictions. Uh, and you don't know how much those particles have spread out. It looks like they spread out more than expected. And so we didn't get nearly as many all at once. But uh, this was a cool shot and we couldn't get to it last week. Okay, this is the big one. The first images from the James Webb Space Telescope will be released July the 12th. They have taken, or they are taking, uh, images through each of the instruments, including NEARIS, which is the Canadian uh, instrument that we've talked about before. And they will be doing a live event on July the 12th and we will be live streaming that. Uh, and we will also, I hope, be able to cover it in the Planetarium uh, Auditorium. We're, we're working with the Canadian Space Agency right now to set up the details of an event where we could actually um, you know, be in collaboration with NASA and the CSA and the other centers watching this. I can't wait to see these pictures. I remember with the Hubble Space Telescope, we were all excited. Uh, and then the first picture came out and I was actually at an astronomy conference in Ottawa when the first Hubble picture came out and it was out of focus and it was, everybody was just crushed. It was horrible. Um, we know that's not gonna be the case with Webb because we saw those perfectly aligned um, calibration pictures. We know that it works and I just can't wait to see, first of all, what they picked to take a picture of with each of these instruments. And then second, what those pictures are going to look like because it's going to set the stage for years and years of discovery so i'm really excited to see that the 12th is um of july which is i think a tuesday is going to be the day you can go to the web space telescopes uh web page and this was they've got lots of stuff on there but one of the things that i thought was cool was they tell you what instrument temperatures are and so here we've got an instrument temperature uh, minus 449 degrees Fahrenheit, only six degrees above absolute zero. This is basically an infrared telescope or a heat telescope. And so the telescope itself and the instruments have to be super cold, otherwise their own heat would interfere with the, the views. So it's just amazing that these things are that cold. 
Um, and then there are some that are a little bit more uh, reasonable. You know, on the hot side, uh, it's about uh, 89 degrees Fahrenheit. So for our American friends, that actually sounds like a nice day. That's what, like 26 or something like that uh, in Canadian or in Celsius? But yeah, on the cold side, minus 384. That's quite the, uh, quite the differential. All right. That brings us to the end of this show. Um, and I do want to thank again, uh, Dr. Ed Clutus for joining us. It was really great to have him here and uh, we'll be touching in with him uh, more in the future because it's just such cool work. It's uh, next week. It is uh, World Ocean Day on June the 8th and our show is on June the 9th. So we're going to take an ocean view of uh, Dome at Home. We're going to look at oceans, not just the oceans here on the earth, of course, which we're relatively familiar with, but oceans throughout the solar system, the subsurface oceans of Io, or of uh, Europa, pardon me, uh, potentially the, um, the oceans on Titan, past oceans on Mars, things like that. So we'll be looking at that and really following the water in the, in the footsteps of NASA. So that's coming up next week. Remember tomorrow, if you're here in town, please join us at uh, the Planetarium if you can. It is all free for uh, First Fridays uh, from five o'clock till nine o'clock. And then um, let's see, we've got uh, all of our regular programming starting up uh, Thursday through Sunday right now. And then towards the end of the month on June 25th, we go to a seven day a week schedule. We'll finally be back to our regular operating schedule after, uh, after all the changes and things like that due to COVID. So thank you all for joining us. I hope you enjoyed the program. We'd love to hear from you. You can always send us mail. You can always uh, uh, you know, hit us up on social media. Fill out the survey if you don't mind, and uh, that will uh, that will help us continue the show. And we will see you all next week. Thanks everybody for joining us. Have a great night.